There we go. Hello everyone. How's it going? Team here and this is BXGS Weekly episode 81 bringing you all the best JavaScript news of the week in a podcast form and today we're gonna have a tiny teeny podcast that doesn't really have that much because for some reason nothing is happening this week. I'm not even sure what's going on but uh, as you can see here we don't really have that many things but uh, nonetheless there is some stuff to discuss and some really good articles so let's get started. As usual, the first section we have here is getting started. We got some pretty nice articles today. So the first one is how to create and manage a Postgres database in Node.js from scratch. So this is a pretty good tutorial guiding you through all the steps you need to basically manage, start, connect and work with Postgres from Node.js. Uh, this does use Docker for the Postgres itself. So if you're not familiar with the Docker, uh, do keep that in mind. Hey Sole, welcome to the stream. It's going good and you know, just uh, doing the usual. All right, continuing. We got the last part in the JavaScript iterators and generators um, article sets. This one is about asynchronous generators. So if you are again learning about the iterators, it, bleh, let me try that again. Iterators and generators in JavaScript and want to learn about asynchronous generators, which is this for of await, uh, what was it? For await off, I think, right? Um, construct, then this one is for you. It does a pretty good job of explaining how they work and how you write your own. The next article we got here is a write up from the V8 dev team about Nullish coalescing, which is uh, coming pretty soon to the Node.js and uh, Chrome. And uh, yeah, it's, you know, it's a nice feature and this just gives you a pretty good tutorial as to when do you want to use it? Why do you need it? And how does it help in a real world situations with some nice examples? And as the matrix here shows, for now, unfortunately, you can only use it with Babel, but uh, it's coming soon. All right, next article we got here is profile a React app for performance. A really cool write up from Mr. Kansi Dodds about the React profiling, all you need to know about the React dev tools and React profiling build that has some specific uh, changes to it, along with other tweaks that you have to typically make to the Webpack config to make profiling a tiny bit easier because you know, the name mangling and stuff like this does mess with it quite a bit. So if you are getting into the React world and you want to profile your applications and you are still confused as to how to do that or maybe how to achieve the proper results and how to see the names of the classes that you actually written, not something random that, you know, Webpack um, compiled, then do check this one out. It's a really good write-up. And next thing we got here is using GitHub Actions for continuous integration. A pretty cool write-up on how to use... Um, GitHub Actions for CI specifically on Node.js projects or NPM projects, I guess, in this case, it's not specifically Node.js. But yes, everything you need to know how to do the basic uh, stuff, how to test with multiple versions of Node, how to handle the artifacts, how to use private NPM registries and stuff like this. It's a pretty straightforward thing. And, you know, I think you can now access GitHub Actions immediately if you go to the GitHub Actions uh, beta page and hit sign up, you will get access right now because it's a beta program now and anyone can get in. Uh, unless I misunderstood the last message they got, but I think this is how it works now. So it's a very nice, um, very nice CI that's basically integrated into GitHub. So if you're curious, do check it out. It's also free even for private repos, which is pretty damn good. So that sounds interesting. Do check this one out. Right, uh, I think that is it for getting started section. As I said, we have very little content this time around, but uh, let's go into the articles and news. We do have two interesting things here today. So the first article is Static Swells, JavaScript blogging with 93% less JavaScript. It's a pretty interesting comparison between um, Sapper and Swells and React and Gatsby and the sort of the trade-offs and benefits that you get by using both, right? So React Gatsby, uh, if you never heard about Gatsby, it's a static website generator that is based on React. It's actually very powerful and allows you to do a lot of very crazy things and obviously compiles to the static pages with some fancy JavaScript that makes a website a lot more dynamic, right? Cypress Welt, well, Svelte is the React competitor, basically the DOM framework and Sapper is sort of like Next.js for it, which is, I mean, it also allows you to kind of compile it statically, but not quite. Also does the server-side rendering and everything. I guess they're kind of comparable. And the author here basically compares creating a blog using Gatsby, which is, you know, 
the primary use case for it, I guess. And using Sapper, which I, you could do a blog with it, it's, it's a framework, you can do anything with it, right? So it's an interesting comparison because obviously the Sapper and Swelts is uh, way smaller than React and uh, reduce uh, uh, results in the build artifacts that are way smaller than those of React at least as long as you don't have too many components. So if your app is not that complex, I think we already discussed this on um, two podcasts ago or something, but it's it's quite interesting. So yeah, there's some comparison of the performance, accessibility and best practices scores. As you can see here, they are more or less the same. Uh, the only ad uh, advantage is that Gatsby basically comes pre-configured as the progressive web app. And there's some additional things needed to make that work with the sapper, which I you know, it's not that hard, but it's just additional, like minor additional work. There's also some differences, uh, like Gatsby is very good with basically bringing all you need out of the box. Like it has the image optimization, it has the styling setup, it has everything you might ever want, and it just works out of the box for the price of the larger build, basically. Uh, but yeah, you know, if that comparison sounds interesting, if you never tried Sapper, I would actually encourage you to do that. I even made a video on it some time ago. It's a very nice framework. And I mean, Swelt itself is also really cool. Um, I don't know, I would like, depending on the use case, we probably wouldn't want to go Gatsby anyway, because it's just way more powerful, but um, it might be an interesting alternative. So there you go. If that sounds interesting, do check out the article. There is a bit more technical details in there. Right, continuing, we got making Instagram come faster, part one. So this is a pretty nice write-up from the Instagram web team um, that describes how they made the Instagram com website faster, how they made the loading better, you know, and more responsive uh, in term, I mean, responsive, not as in the screen size, but responsive as in the speed response. Um, there's some interesting things here. So they talk a lot in this article specifically about image and data prefetching. Um, there's some things that I didn't even know exists, like the fact that you could actually preload, uh, no, not the scripts, preload the JSON by using the link preload tag, which is, I did not know that was a thing, which is quite interesting. Um, there's also some additional things, uh, as well as the discussion of the problems with preload pre pre prioritization, that in some cases, uh, what was interesting to me, resulted in... Um, slowing down the overall page load time instead of speeding it up on the Wi-Fi. So whenever you're on a fast network, it's actually gonna be slower than if you don't preload, which was uh, pretty interesting. Um, yeah, other than, that, other than that, you know, there's discussion of stuff like images, correctly loading the out of screen contents and uh, things like this. So if you are interested in this kind of optimizations, do check it out, it's a pretty good write up. There's a part two coming uh, soon as well. And I think I'll, I'm hoping I'm gonna be able to cover that on the next podcast, but uh, you know, we'll see when they release it basically. I seems to have missed this one somehow. Maybe the part two is already there. So I've, yeah, that seems to be not so new, but okay, you know what, whatever. So um, continuing, uh, this is actually it for articles and news just two this week around. Uh, now we're coming to the tips, tricks and bit-sized awesomeness and uh, not so awesomeness this time around because there are some Pretty grim news for NPM, but um, let's just first talk about good things. So the first cool thing we got here is a demo from the Firefox DevTools team. The Firefox debugger now shows inline previews for the values. So whenever you debug and do a break within the function, you will actually see the values of given variables, objects, whatever, right in line, which looks absolutely fantastic. So, you know, I mean, using call stack and seeing the current stack is not that problematic, but it is definitely a lot easier just to see the everything in in line. Okay, you don't actually see it unless you do a breakpoint, but whatever. So this is a pretty neat uh, thing. And yeah, I guess, you know, if you're using Firefox, good news to you. I wonder if we'll ever see something similar in Chromium. Right, next thing we got here is a pretty neat little write-up from the Wikipedia guys. It's called Wikipedia's JavaScript Installation on a Budget, and it discusses how they decreased the JavaScript bundle from 36 kilobytes, it was tiny, 36 kilobytes, to 28 kilobytes. And there's also an interesting fact on why is it 28, 28 kilobytes, 
And how does TCP come, you know, the TCP protocol comes into the play here because it's 28 kilobytes is the size of two 14 kilobyte, kilobyte bursts of TCP packets, which is something I wasn't even aware of, but uh, there is some really cool information over here. Now, the mind blowing numbers here are uh, just saving those, what, eight kilobytes in bundle size would um, save 4.3 terabytes a day of data bandwidth for users page views. Just think about that. Now, it is insane how many people load uh, Wikipedia. It is just crazy. And uh, tiny, yes, I mean, this is the thing, right? So it's like the, the bundle on its own is super tiny, but when you account the number of pages that are loaded daily, it just becomes mind-blowingly large. <laughs> Um, there is a write-up on uh, the specifics that, uh, first of all, how the Wikipedia bundling works, uh, because they split it into like different modules and then the modules are loaded together with uh, the resource loader. And then there's basically the description of how they optimized it. Interesting thing I found is that they actually, uh, one of the optimizations was to have fewer modules. So actually they took the modules that work together and they basically always loaded together and merged them into one larger module. And that actually resulted in a decrease of size and a speed up in loading, which is quite interesting in my opinion. Also stuff like a decrease in the metadata and it looks like they want to push even more, you know, smaller. This Again, I would go for this, uh, suggest to read this, uh, the 14 kilobyte uh, TCP initial window message. So why exactly is it 28 kilobytes for them? And what is this 14 kilobyte magic number basically, which was uh, pretty enlightening. Like the article is really good. Again, it's not super large, but it's, you know, something I never thought about basically. I would quietly suggest reading that. All right, now we are coming to the NPM situation and uh, who boy, doesn't it look it doesn't really look good. So there's two posts from NPM. Uh, the first one is the avoiding the tragedy of commons, acceptable use of public registry. This one is not that terrible, but I just found it interesting. So th this is a write up of uh, from NPM guys that says that basically there's a bunch of companies that uh, sends millions of requests to NPM daily, which is mind blowing. So just, you know, just think about it for a second. Uh, they already contacted all of those companies and they're working with them to figure out how to prevent this basically so that they don't crash the registry for everyone else. But it's, you know, it's an interesting situation that I never thought might happen because who the hell would actually want to request the NPM millions of times per day? I imagine it could be like CI services, but they probably have cash, so that should not be, a, but it's, it's interesting. So the write-up itself is quite interesting. If you're curious about how the public registries are used in the wild, do give it a read. Um, there's some interesting information here. But then again, you know, I never expected that they would have a problem like this, which is uh, curious. And in the less, less encouraging news, let's put it this way, we got NPM CEO Brian Bogensberger, which, who was hired, uh, I think, like a, a year ago, even less than a year ago. Um, departs the NPM. He's no longer a CEO there. And now NPM is looking for a new CEO, which doesn't really look that good for NPM. Eh? First, they lose all the technical team. And now the CEO just goes away after nine, 10 months or whatever he was in a ruling. And yeah, at this point, you know what? I'm really happy that GitHub is now mirroring the NPM registry because if NPM goes down, we got at least some sort of a replacement for it. But this is boy, this is not very good. I really would be happy if Microsoft just buys that and integrates into GitHub. <laughs> that would be like perfect, perfect uh, resolution of the whole situation. But yeah, that is, the whole situation is just bonkers. But um, yeah, this is basically all I have for the bit size stuff. Uh, now we're coming to the releases. The first major release of the week is Safari 13, which is gonna ship on iOS 13 and uh, Mac OS 10.15. Uh, the two highlights that I want to basically two highlights I want to highlight no two major changes that I want to highlight is the desktop class browsing for Safari uh, for iPad. So if you are owner of iPad, you are now going to have the desktop Safari running there, which is pretty damn awesome. So I imagine they're going to test it first on Safari and then do the same for iOS, like for the whole iOS and do it on iPhones 
which is going to be a game changer because the, let's be honest, the version of Safari on iOS just was abysmal and lagging in, in terms of format, like standard supports a lot in comparison to Chrome and Firefox. So uh, that's, you know, that's great to see. Uh, hey, Donna, welcome to the stream. All right, and the second cool thing, so, okay, there's like, you know, FIDA 2 USB security stake support with web authentication. But the other cool thing that I want to highlight is finally Safari gets the pointer events. So you no longer have to polyfill that and you can just use point, generic pointer events instead of clicking and pointing and it will just work, which is great. Uh, Donna, thank you very much for your donation and for your continued support as usual, highly appreciated. Uh, but yeah, if you're interested about the other stuff coming to Safari 13, make sure to read this through. But I think, you know, those two things are like the biggest uh, changes, which is pretty interesting to see how that develops. But um, yeah, there we go. Next release we got here is Storybook version 5.2, delivering us zero configuration component docs. So this seems to be the documentation focused release, which looks pretty slick. So if you're working with the component libraries and you need to document them, now you can just do it basically in line with a very nice uh, setup. And uh, yeah, this is this is pretty great. So if you're working with Storybook, make sure to check out the new release. If you are not working with Storybook, but maintaining a set of components, make sure to check out the Storybook in general, because it can be very helpful to you. Next thing we got here is ViewPress version 1.1.0 with a bunch of minor bug fixes and some improvements to the CI process and better error logging. Seems to be developing at a nice pace. Uh, ViewPress is a pretty nice static website generator. If you never heard about it, it's all based on Vue.js. If you don't like React but like Vue, maybe check it out. Maybe this is exactly what you were looking for. All right, and uh, the last thing is we got Chrome 78 beta with a new Houdini API in two origin trials. The native file system API access is now in beta and SMS Retriever API is now also available in beta. So you can actually install it and access native file system and sys uh, uh, God damn it. And retrieve SMS is what I want to say. <laughs> that advert is long, which advert? Oh, I guess you are talking about the Twitch adverts. Yeah, they can be annoying sometimes. Sorry about that. Unfortunately, it's not in my uh, power to disable them. As far as I know, at least I would turn off the advertisements if I could, because I know how pre-roll ads are annoying, but uh, can't really do anything about that, sorry. Okay, uh, coming back to the podcast. This was it for the releases. Now we're coming to the libraries and demos. The first thing we got here today is Solenia, um, which is an amusing name, uh, at least for the, you know, I guess Slav countries, because this basically means pickles in Russian and, uh, <laughs> which is absolutely hilarious. Uh, but um, the library itself is, as the description says, mega powerful micro framework. So it's a web framework that uh, titled is like conceptual simplicity, but those diagrams that they have is not simple at all. Like, you know, it's, it's, it's your kind of MVC like framework, I guess, for building apps and um, yeah, I don't really know what to say about it. It seems to be very complex. And I, after reading README, I couldn't quite figure out why would I prefer that over something like React or Swell, for example, because it doesn't really highlight its strong points, you know? So I'm not even sure why, but maybe you know, maybe you're curious about the new framework. So do make sure to check this one out if that sounds interesting. Next thing we got here is Nano SQL, universal database layer for the client server and mobile devices. Uh, it's like Lego for databases. It seems actually quite nice. So you basically have this uh, Nano SQL wrapper that allows you to uh, interact with data, query it and execute SQL over it. And uh, it also supports a variety of backends. So you can just use it. It's gonna work in memory then, or you can point it towards stuff like SnapDB for Node.js and Electron or IndexedDB WebSQL and local storage for the browser, or you can even connect it to Redis, MySQL, Mongo, whatever you want, which uh, can be quite handy. Like the API seems quite nice. So if you are working with databases and that sounds interesting, do check it out. Next thing we got here is Headroom.js. Give your pages some headroom, hide your header until you need it. So it's the header manipulation thingy, which 
Seems to be working quite nicely. It's also very lightweight and simple. It doesn't really uh, tie to any framework. So it's framework agnostic and uh, usable with, well, basically anything. You just do DOM selector and point it towards your header element and that's it. So if you were looking for something like this, do check it out. Next thing we got here is Saber, the static website generator in Vue.js, yet another one. Uh, the difference between this one and Vuepress, so they actually have a very nice comparison right off the bat with Hex or Hugo, Vuepress and Gridsome. So uh, I'll just read the comparison with Vuepress. So Vuepress is purely Markdown based as far as I know, right? Now Saber actually allows you to build your pages using the Vue or JS pages, uh, the same manner that the Gatsby does this for React components, which is actually super powerful. So if you are looking for a framework like this, do check it out, it seems to have very good documentation, it seems to be quite nicely developed and uh, yes, quite damn um, powerful. So there you go. Also theme support and everything and even two themes out of the box, which is uh, quite nice. All right, continuing, we got uh, Roy, you know what, I, <laughs> I don't even know how to read that. Uh, Roy GBIV, let's put it this way, a 3D game engine for the web. And um, yeah, this is just a WebGL based uh, game engine that is completely open source, uses 3JS, and there's like a bunch of demos that work in a browser and it's like, you know, the shooting demo where you have a fading boxes. I'm not even sure why there's a fading shader on them, but uh, that's a thing. And yes, you know, they are interactive and this is like full 3D and you can jump and you can shoot and then you can have a look at the source code of that. So. If you want to delve into 3D graphics in WebGL, then do check this one out. This uh, looks pretty damn interesting. Kind of like Gatsby JS for Vue. Yes, it does have a lot of parallels with Gatsby, so it's a pretty nice comparison. All right, continuing, we got React Rainbow Components Library, which has quite a bunch of components that look pretty slick. Um, I mean, other than that, you know, it's just a component library with, well, React components including stuff like application, breadcrumbs, sidebar, whatever the hell you can imagine. All of that is here. Looks quite nice. Uh, you know, if you want to assemble something on your own without uh, customizing it much, this probably is a good pick. Um, yeah, other than that, I don't really know what to say about that. It's a component library. All right. Next thing we got here is Faking Goose, an automatic mock data generator for Mongoose using schema definition. That can be very handy. So basically takes in the mongoose uh, model, the schema, and then just generates the fake data for you and uh, throws it into the, yeah, basically you can use it in testing, you can use it in generating the user, uh, what do you call it, the test data basically for, you know, the staging deployments is what I want to say. God, I'm so terrible today, but there we go. So if you're working with Mongoose a lot and you need to generate a lot of test data and you don't want to do it by hand, do check this one out. It actually seems to be pretty damn good. Right, continuing, we got saturated from Mr. Luke Edwards here, a tiny two point, uh, sorry, 203 byte utility to enqueue items to batch processing and or satisfying rate limits. So essentially batch processing with rate limiting and intervals, uh, which also allows you to flush the queues if you want to. Very simple API, seems to be quite nice. Again, 203 bytes, super tiny. So um, there you go. Does it have an editable grid? Uh, you mean the view, what it was, what was it called? The Saber. I don't think it actually comes with any grid. So I guess it's like bring your own framework because why would it bring anything, right? Does have like the layouts. I don't know if it uses, yeah, it doesn't seem like it has anything by default. So it's like very much like Gatsby where you have to bring your own CSS framework. But okay, continuing, we got uh, JSON box, a free HTTP based JSON storage. A pretty nice JSON storage that you can also use for free uh, if you don't want to host your own uh, by just executing post and get requests to a specific uh, JSON box. Um, there are some limits of, of course, because it's free, uh, but uh, yes, it is pretty nice. It's essentially just MongoDB with crude capabilities exposed to everyone. And it's also open source. You can self host if you want to. You were asking about the rainbow thing. Uh, it's a good question. I don't know if it has any grids or anything. So there's forms, there's miscellaneous, there's data view. No, it seems like it doesn't have any grids. So it's just purely components uh, sets. 
doesn't seem like there's any layout at all. There's like breadcrumbs, page nation, tap sets, and kind of some layouting, but no grids, no nothing like this, I guess. I mean, at least, you know, I don't really see anything um, related to that. So it seems more like pure component library that you use together with some other grid. Okay. Continuing, we got Teddy, a React apps uh, with games using animations. That is, uh, that's not exactly what it says, but okay. You know what? Let me just rephrase that. It's essentially um, kind of a app for children with integrated games that is built using React with animations using React Spring. Now, this is all React. What you're looking here is React as games. And all of them, again, all of those animations, everything is made using React. And it works pretty damn well. And, you know, this is just basically a showcase of how good the animations in React can be. Page transitions, image transitions, moving things, it is just insane. Obviously, the games are very simplistic, but, you know, the, just as a demonstration of uh, capabilities of React, this is really, really cool. So if you're interested in how to make your own animations like this, do check out the source code. It is on GitHub. And uh, yes, it is React Spring and React Hooks only. Pretty damn good. All right. Continuing, we got use screen size, a small utility hook to get the screen size of the screen matching the media queries. Um, this is sometimes can be extremely useful when you wanna basically show or hide things based on the media queries within your code, which I mean, it's very rare, but it does happen from time to time. And uh, you know, having a hook for that is uh, pretty damn handy. So that sounds interesting, do check it out. And next thing we got here is, oh yes, this is actually it for the libraries and demos. So I only have like, two interesting and silly things to uh, close this off. The first one is this uh, super scary repo that says that SVG is actually Turing complete. And there's the implementation here, which is again, absolutely terrifying. But uh, if you wanna dive into that, be my guest. And the last thing I wanna show off here is this um, guy, Matt Steele, that um, uh, who, implemented a GitHub action to dispense, uh, blah, let me try that again, to dispense candy whenever he commits code. I need that in my life as well. So I need to buy the candy dispenser and then make a GitHub action that will reward me for committing code. That sounds like a terrible habit, but um, yes, there we go. Right, um, this is it from my side. So I uh, guess if you guys have any questions, suggestions, now is the time to throw them into the chat. We'll be more than happy to answer them. Again, today was a super tiny episode. We don't have that much stuff, but um, yeah. Some dudes released a pure React game on Steam. Uh, oh, that's interesting. If you find a name, do share it here on a Discord server. We'll be quite curious to see that because I've never heard about that. That sounds like a really cool project. Um, Donna, yes, chat, feel free to throw it in there. Again, if you're, you know, you're always on our Discord server, so we can just talk there as well. That's not a problem. <laughs> Okay, so again, guys, you have like two minutes to throw your questions and suggestions or links I might have missed or your personal projects into the chat right now. If not, then uh, thank you very much for watching. Again, you can find all the links on GitHub or on bxjs.dev. And uh, yeah, you can join our Discord server to discuss any of that. And that's basically it from my side. Good week to be on vacation. Indeed, that seems like just half of JavaScript community left for vacations. <laughs> uh, was talked on podcast on Syntax FM. Okay, I will uh, put that tab aside and we'll check it out later and try to find it because that does sound interesting. I would be very curious to see what kind of game could you make using just React and put it on Steam. I mean, I guess React is pretty damn powerful as you can you can go quite crazy there, but I would still be very interesting to see that. All right, doesn't seem like we have any more questions or suggestions. So thank you, Gary. Blah. Thank you, Gary. No, thank you guys very much for watching. Hope you enjoyed the podcast. I was absolutely terrible today. I am planning to do a strappy stream uh, this week, or I guess next week, uh, since it's still Saturday. So I'm going to have a Wednesday stream for strappy likely uh, keep tuned to my Twitter or Discord to see the times. And uh, yeah, thank you guys very much for watching. 
Have an awesome rest of the weekend or rest of the week if you're watching a video of this. And I see you next time. Bye.